Thank you, Ron. Um, <clears throat> so here's my talk. I'm assuming you can all see it. We see it. Great. Um, I need to start with brief um, announcements, self-identification, I should say. Um, for those of you who don't know, the Ocean Map Library and Smith Center for Cartographic Education at the University of Southern Maine has a very nice space, including excellent globe collection, uh, digital facilities. It has a website, oceanmaps.org, that most of the items uh, you can, uh, I'll be showing today, you can consult their high resolution. Um, <clears throat> and in fact, the entire exhibit is online. I'll give you the URLs as we go through. Um, and then the other blurb is my other job, the History of Cartography Project. As Ron said, Volume 4, the European Enlightenment, uh, that I co-edited with the wonderful Mary Pedley, um, officially copyrighted 2019, but came out in March or so. Um, another umpteen pounds of sheer scholarly goodness. If you don't have it, you should get it. It's wonderful. With volume four done, that means there's only one volume left to go, volume five, the 19th century, which is currently in preparation. And um, eventually, maybe we'll be done. Ha, we'll see. Um, one of the things I have been able to do uh, is to uh, persuade the press to put all the volumes of the history uh, online for free access. Um, volumes one through three and six are online. Uh, four and five will go up about three years after print publication. So we should see volume four, for example, online in 2023. And so far, uh, we have had uh, just over 3.7 million hits, um, at least through uh, last June. I just realized I need to get the metrics for the second half of last year. Um, so 3.7 million hits, uh, downloads, accesses to the chapters, which is not shabby. And the really annoying thing about having being host is that I keep getting bing by new people coming into the waiting room, which takes away my access to the PowerPoint slides. So I'm gonna keep clicking. Anyway, that's my problem, not yours. So um, today's talk is um, really about the exhibit that I curated uh, for the Ocean Map Library uh, to mark the bicentennial of Maine statehood. Um, you can find it either from the general website, oceanmaps.org or you can go straight to it with this URL. I really must, must thank um, several people for helping me with this exhibit. Libby Bischoff, the executive director of the Ocean Map Library, uh, who was an indispensable help in many, many areas. James Francis, Penobscot tribal historian, gave great advice and contributed some reflections on a couple of maps which are in the exhibit and they're online as well. Dave Nykirk and Adina Barnett took the imagery, Hope Maori assembled the website, and Kevin Kimball of Kimball Street Studios in Lewiston uh, did the installation, and it looks really, really cool. Um, this talk only addresses one particular thread that runs through the show. Um, so if you are able, please go and see it in person. Uh, it is up through the end of March, and you can book times to go visit. Again, oceanmaps.org for more information on that. And if you can't get to Southern Maine in person, uh, I must admit we're now entering the dark side of the year with the snow and everything. Um, you can, of course, see it all online. So the event, the cause of this presentation um, is the fact that in 15th of March, 1820, the Eastern District of Massachusetts became the independent state of Maine as the 23rd state in the Union. Um, 
just a bit more explanation. URLs of images are at the bottom and the bold numbers indicate the number of the item in the show. But how do we treat the bicentennial? We have certainly learned the lessons of the Columbus Quincentennial in 1992. The European exploration and settlement of the Americas, we now know, came at a profound cost to the native peoples and environments of the New World. In the Map Library's case, our exhibit cannot simply laud geography, exploration, science, and empire like the 1922 advert for Ram McNally, which also includes the, <coughs> uh, the myth that Columbus proved the world was round. <clears throat> we cannot show off great maps without also thinking uh, about maps as images of power and tools of empire and without also actively working to reclaim other kinds of maps and other conceptions of space. The building that houses the exhibition occupies land whose reclamation from the sea in the 19th century destroyed the inshore waters that had once sustained the Wabanaki peoples of Aquasisco. We cannot celebrate Maine's 200th birthday without also commemorating the displacement of the Wabanaki peoples, the people of the Dawnland, heirs to a continual inhabitation for at least 12 to 13,000 years of the land that would become Maine, and in fact, the much larger area of New England, Canadian Maritimes, the Gas Bay, and so on. The Wabanaki themselves made maps. It was largely oral in practice, but when inscribed, it was in less durable form, less than durable forms. With hechonol etched on birk bark like this one, or glyphs engraved on rocks to be eroded or covered by later carvings. These kinds of works were still further embedded in oral practices and performance, as we'll come to. These are not the kind of maps the Ocean Map Library collects. We must trace, therefore, multiple paths through the maps made by Europeans and Americans to construct a more sensitive spatial history of Maine. And the map library's collections allow us to <clears throat> indicate some of the wider spatial patterns of Wabanaki and Maine history of, over the last four centuries by following in particular the displacement, but also the persistence of the Penobscot peoples, one of the major groups within the Wabanaki. The Wabanaki themselves are clearly present in the first maps made by Europeans. In these detailed maps of the research rich estuaries of the Kennebec and the Saco rivers by Samuel de Champlain, he visited them in 1605. These were published in 1613. On the right, we have the mouth of the Saco River. Towards the south of Maine, I'll have a map of Maine for everyone who doesn't know the main geography, which is most everybody here um, in a few minutes. Saco is firmly in the south of Maine within the region of corn cultivation that by about a thousand years ago had led to the formation of year round settlements with long houses as well as um, wigwams, as you can see in this detail on the right. On the left, the mouth of the Kennebec marks the traditional limit of corn cultivation. We don't see the corn fields here, but we do see um, indications of temporary villages will be occupied through the summer months in particular. From the Kennebec River eastwards, uh, all the way through the Gas Bay was a region of migratory hunter gatherers, uh, very well traveled, very active. Mark Lescarbeau's map of 1609, which is derived also from Champlain's 1605 trip, notes the scattering, uh, shows a lot of the, the native presence. I should say that you should, you should see there are a bunch of trees across this map and a few buildings. These aren't saying, here's one tree, here's another tree, here's another tree. This is the sign for all this forest and that there are not just these villages, but there are many villages. 
Looking at this detail of Maine and Northern New England, we can see some of these. Um, this town, this place Malabar is what Champlain called, what we call Cape Cod today. And we can find a mix of Wabanaki group and place names, and also some imposed place names. Uh, two large names, we have the, uh, um, you know, get it right, Amushikwa and the Eshermans, which are the uh, French herd trans transcribed, na transcribed names for local Wabanaki groups. We have uh, Kinebeki and Shakoit, which is to say the Kennebec and Saco rivers. These are indigenous names that have been uh, heard and are being used by Champlain and then later the colonists um, as river names. We have an imposed place name in the case of Norumbega. This was a European reference to a hundred year old European myth that was irrelevant both to the indigenous peoples of the area and to the eventual settlers who all continue to use the Abenaki name, Penobscot. Then we have an imposed name, the St. Croix, River St. Croix, um, which was not adopted by colonists and again, not by um, the local Wabanaki um, until much later for odd reasons, which I'm not gonna get into unless you wanna get into it in question time. And finally, there's another imposition River Zanchon, the St. John River. This was adopted quite early uh, for legal reasons because this is one of the rivers that gets adopted by Europeans, by European monarchs, when they start carving out the territory to allocate it without any regard for the local populations so that different European groups can access the land and the resources uh, for various reasons. And because it's in encoded in charters and patents, it very much gets persistent. It, it, it has a persistence that continues. This is, um, oops, I should, Plymouth should not be there, never mind. Um, this is one of the, my favorite maps, probably the most important map in the entire show. It, we have it borrowed from the John Carter Brown Library, so I must thank everybody there for the loan of the item. Uh, it's a, based on uh, a 1683 map uh, that shows Massachusetts Bay's territorial claims. For those of you unfamiliar with the details of New England's geography, um, here are some basic places. We've got the Plymouth Colony down at the bottom, founded 1620. We have, um, here we have the rest. Maine at the top, um, you got the Kennebec River and the Sucker River shown there. Then you've got moving south, you have New Hampshire, Massachusetts Bay, Rhode Island, and Connecticut. There are so many great things about this map. First of all, um, it indicates quite nicely the different strategies by which the English came to settle in and around Massachusetts Bay. Um, there are a few, uh, what we can call nucleated settlements or urban places, Salem, founded 1628, Boston, 1629, Charlestown, Cambridge, and so on, all of which are tightly structured. They have um, non-agricultural economies. Um, Boston, Salem are ports, Charlestown, Cambridge have other things going on as market towns. Um, and then around them, <coughs> pardon me, <clears throat> Around them are a whole series of dispersed agricultural settlements that in New England have the name town. For non-New Englanders, this is really confusing. A town is a dispersed area over which people are scattered. Um, they get divided up as population grows and eventually sort of become standardized at about six miles by six miles, roughly that is then gonna get carried over into the uh, rectangular land surveys of the federal era. And I must stress that the modern image we have today of that nucleated New England town clustered around a green with a white clapboard meeting house and so on 
is actually the creation of early 19th century industrialization in New England and has nothing to do with the colonial era of settlement. This map also uh, is suggestive of a reliance on the part of the colonists who made the map on indigenous information. And in particular, the enlarged Lake Winnipesaukee is filled with many islands and just below it has this rather bulbous larynx, a definite thyroid problem on the, what's called the uh, upper Merrimack River. This is very reminiscent in style of the ways in which Europeans interpreted indigenous information that, was, that had been communicated in the performative process in which um, some indigenous source, in this case with these extra maps, uh, the Cree native, Oshagash, um, who told some French traders um, about the nature of the rivers to the west of Lake Superior. And in doing so, might have scratched something in the sand, might have used pencil on paper, but the place names and everything else were, were delivered orally, they weren't written down, and then they're transcribed by the French. And in the process, uh, all sorts of little confusions happen uh, in the translation process. Um, so this kind of, of depiction um, very much suggests a native source of information that's still being used by the colonists in the 1670s. Now, the reason for this map though, was to lay out Massachusetts Bay's territorial claims, um, which is all basically a question of latitude, which is why down the middle you have that large um, latitude scale. So this map also is a very nice way of explaining why Maine was part of Massachusetts to begin with, um, such that it had to become independent as late as 1820. Now in 1629, the Massachusetts Bay Company was given a charter um, by Charles, uh, King James. And King James and his crew knew that we had the Merrimack River and the Charles River that they assumed flew directly west or flowed from the west um, to the sea. Um, and so they defined the Massachusetts Bay Territory as lying within three miles to the north of the Merrimack and three miles to the south of River Charles, thinking they would have this kind of, of barrier, this, this, these kinds of boundaries, not realizing that both the Merrimack and the Charles take turns to the north and the south respectively. So in 1635, some of the colonists, rather unhappy with the uh, puritanical magistrates of Massachusetts Bay um, and wanting fresh land to graze their cattle, headed inland to the Connecticut River, shown on the left. So the first question facing the Massachusetts, Massachusetts magistrates was, did these new settlements fall within the permitted bounds, the, the legally defined bounds of Massachusetts Bay? So they sent Nathaniel Woodward and Solomon Saffrey in 1641 to go up to the head of the Charles River. Uh, there they measured the latitude, <coughs> pardon me, um, took up a few minutes of latitude for the three mile buffer. And then they went by land along what's called the Pequot Trail um, to the Connecticut River where they found, where they Look, figured out where the same parallel of latitude uh, lay. And they found that all the new Connecticut uh, towns were indeed <clears throat> south of that boundary. And therefore those towns were not part of Massachusetts Bay. Ultimately, they're gonna, of course, they're gonna become part of uh, Connecticut. And then in 1652, <clears throat> they sent uh, John Sherman and Jonathan Eins to the head of the Merrimack River uh, to figure out the source of the Merrimack, added three more miles to get that degree. And then the following year, sent out a couple of mariners to figure out where that um, parallel latitude cuts the coast. This is very, the timing on this is very important. Um, <clears throat> 
Charles I was executed in 1649, and with the dissolution of all the royal charters, Massachusetts Bay laid claim to these territories in southern what are now southern Maine for their timber, for the timber resources. And they were able to subsequently justify that annexation of territory by means of this, this sort of um, latitudinal ledger domain, shall we say. And I should just say right um, where the, the parallel cuts the main coast round about where Portland, Maine is and where I live for that matter. Massachusetts Bay's territorial aggression was directed inwards as well um, in series of conflicts with native peoples, all various tribes of the Babanaki. The so-called King's Philip's War in 1675, 76 in Southern New England um, was followed by a long series of conflicts that ran through about 1715 uh, in Northern New England. These conflicts were commemorated by another map taken from the same source as the manuscript uh, published by William Hubbard in his uh, narrative of the wars with um, the Wabanaki. <clears throat> Here is John Smith's, uh, John Smith, I'm sorry, William, <laughs> William Hubbard's map um, in its true orientation, north is at the right, um, and is covered in details, uh, a lot of numbers, and the numbers actually refer to entries in a summary part of the book. So number 55 at the top of this detail, which is um, the town of Falmouth, which will ultimately become part of Portland, or well, Portland is part of Falmouth. 55, Falmouth. On the hither side of Casco Bay, where August 11, about 34 persons were killed and taken by the Indians. And then there's three page references to direct the reader to actual passages in the main narrative. The whole uh, book is a really very complex um, intermeshing of map, summary index, and narrative. In this more expansive detail of Maine, um, there is uh, just in the inland uh, in the upper right corner, you can see a couple of figures, almost certainly native figures, coming out of the northern woodlands, uh, rifles over their shoulders, uh, suggestive of the ongoing conflict. Eventually, that ongoing conflict would push all the colonial settlement that had been already in Maine out again. <coughs> And so there's a, there will eventually be a whole new series of settlement after 1720. Other figures. <clears throat> I must also note that Massachusetts Bay um, claimed through various mechanisms control of most of the Eastern seaboard. <clears throat> uh, Plymouth Colony was merged with Massachusetts Bay in 1690. Uh, it claims province of Maine because of the little bit of southern Maine that was part of the original boundary by its interpretation. Nova Scotia it claimed, even though there's a large French settlement there. And the territories in between the Duke of York's territory had been given to Massachusetts to administer, even though they had no right to, to issue land claims in this area. <clears throat> Against this territorial little mini empire, uh, Charles II created New Hampshire in 1679, the red blob here, specifically to try to counteract Ma uh, Massachusetts um, territorial growth. Um, it didn't really work. <laughs> that, that's not a whole story. Um, this map is also really handy for showing what is meant. You might have heard of the phrase down east. Um, when you're shipping out of Boston, um, the currents and the winds take you down the coast eastwards in an easterly direction. So that's down east from Boston. Um, and what you do then, you sail along the main, the mainland, which becomes the sort of the name of this northerly district, uh, or the eastern district of Massachusetts, Maine. Um, another great map from the collection, the 1802 map of Maine, uh, when it's still part of Massachusetts by Osgood Carlton, 
This is accompanied by another large map, also Massachusetts itself. The title cartouche is very nice in explaining why the English and then later the Americans are really interested in settling in this part of the world. <clears throat> Timber, first and foremost. Um, Maine, not for nothing, is known as the pine tree state. Um, we are a major source of uh, mast trees that were perfect for making into masts for the Royal Navy. Uh, and in the background of this cartouche, you've also got um, a nice little scene of farming. Um, it's land, it's timber. These are the two, um, and for that matter, fish out to sea are the things that are driving settlement um, by the English and the Americans to colonize this region. Colonization picked up again, as I intimated after 1716, 1720, when the Wabanaki are, are finally admitted um, that they've been defeated by the colonists. They've been weakened through several decades of war and they're no longer able to uh, resist um, re-encroachment by the English. Um, and there's a whole series of very complex um, property dealings between the Wabanaki and the English. Uh, Ian Saxine's recent book goes into this in great topic. It's a great detail, it's a very good book. <clears throat> the towns are laid out um, in large patents, but also within these, these towns as well. And the patents are also divided into towns of further settlement. Uh, and the result is a fairly nice layering of um, settlement. The towns don't overlap each other, they're nice and neat. And then they ultimately get bound up into uh, colonies, and uh, not colonies, sorry, counties, can't read my own handwriting. Um, 1760, the, the District of Maine is also the County of York and 1760 is further subdivided into the County of Cumberland and the County of Lincoln, shown here in this map by John Small, made for the then governor of Massachusetts, Sir Francis Bernard. This map also has um, very nice details um, showing meeting houses uh, in Scarborough on the left of this detail, um, and in Cape Elizabeth on the right. You have individual little churches, which are the meeting houses. Um, each town is, is a social community, an economic community uh, centered on the meeting house, which is sort of the, the religious church, but is also the site of local democracy. Um, wonderfully complex system. But you also have, you can see on the sort of the center to the right, um, a depiction of the nucleated settlement, the port uh, in Falmouth, that will eventually be given the name of Portland in 1786. Again, just want to stress the nice, neat territorial uh, formation of um, the colonization um, that overlays and obscures existing and persistent Penobscot and other Wabanaki um, settlement. But toward the edges of this map, you still see um, two major native sites, uh, Norwichwak in particular, uh, up on the Penobscot, no, Kennebec River, sorry, um, and up near Livermore Falls, uh, near the boundary with between Cumberland and York counties. Notice that both of these, these sites are um, both next to uh, falls, river falls. Falls were very, very important in, um, as a resource site for fishing in particular. Um, and so it's not it's understandable that there's a large native site next to them. So over time, this, this, this map from 1761 indicates sort of this, suggests the ways in which um, the Penobscot Wabanaki as a whole are being mapped out of the, of the land. And this is really clear in a series of maps made by Osgood Carlton in the 1790s into the early 19th, in, to 1802. This map made in 17, well, I should say in 1775, during the revolution, Massachusetts Bay passed a resolve, very magnanimous of them. They would not permit further encroachment onto Penobscot lands 
within six miles of the river Penobscot. If the Penobscot remained loyal to, to the revolutionaries during the revolution and didn't side with the British. The Penobscot sided with the Americans and were rewarded uh, by the post-independence argument by Massachusetts Bay that in making this agreement, the Penobscot had agreed that their lands extended only to six miles to either side of the river. And those lands were soon encroached on anyway. So on the 1795 map that Oscar Carlton made for Massachusetts Bay authorities, we have a uh, detail of Hancock County. And you can see uh, running along, um, up, running north south, uh, the Penobscot River. Uh, and the phrase Penobscot Indian land, which is written differently from the name of the river itself. So it really is indicating the, the tribal lands of the Penobscot people. And if we look, and you can see that the lands already being encroached upon. If we look even more closely, we can see that there are uh, lands encroaching onto within the six mile on either side. So you've got where the yellow arrow points, you've got the beginning of the word Penobscot Indian lands, and already there are towns being created um, on what should be Indian territory. Um, I do want to show two things. One is here. This is the town of Bangor, um, which will, of course, become the city of Bangor when it grows up in the 19th century. And it has a very distinctive uh, northern edge with that little jog in it. Um, I'm going to come back to that in a few later slides. Um, the other thing I want to show you is in green here. Uh, this is roughly the location of the Piscataqua River, um, not the Piscataquis, which forms a boundary between Maine and New Hampshire, but Piscata Piscataqua, uh, which is one of the main tributaries of the Penobscot. And this is again going to become important. Sorry, I got it wrong way around. This is the Piscataquis, not the Piscataqua. Anyway. This is going to become important in the next few slides. Over time, the Penobscot lands were whittled away. In 1796, uh, by treaty, the Penobscot gave up all their lands below the Piscataquis River. So everything from that green line on the previous slide southwards um, was turned over to the state, except for the islands in the river itself, which is going to become a major point in the 20th century. You can see here the northern edge of the town of Bangor. Um, and then above that, to the north of that, are these ranges of towns that are uh, being prepared to be sold off uh, to new, well, to be created into towns, which are then going to be sold off uh, to settlers. Um, there, here's some detail of uh, marshes and Old Town Island. Um, the square Indian Old Town, this is the, the remains, this is the last chunk of the Penobscot Reservation, uh, just 200 acres of everything that they once had. Uh, in the circle is roughly the location of Umaine Orono, um, the main campus of the University of Maine, which already you can see on this map by Carlton from 1798, um, there are already mills have been put up between the mainland and Marsh Island. Um, I should also say this map comes from Harvard map collection. Um, and so my thanks to everybody there for the loan of this item. And I should also note Paul von den Brink led me to a link uh, just two weeks ago last week um, that suggests another copy of this map exists. I thought this was a unique impression, but there's another one uh, in the Netherlands, long story. Moving into the 19th century, um, as Maine gets more and more fully colonized and large population growth is, is booming in many ways, um, there is greater and greater agitation for independence. Moses Greenleaf made this map in 1815 as part of a, a larger work, there's a book that goes with it, that argues that Maine is a self-contained 
entity that is quite different from the rest of Massachusetts. And in fact, it has developed sufficiently in its economy that it can be independent. Um, the real kicker was the way though that uh, the Massachusetts authorities during the War of 1812 had basically refused to send any aid to Maine to stop a British encroachment um, along the coast. And as such, um, a lot of Maine has got rather unhappy <laughs> with the Massachusetts people. And um, so eventually, through a series of votes, um, finally agreed to secede. In the period, in the same period, the process of dispossession, the mapping out of Native peoples continues. Um, Here's the 1820 version of Greenleaf's 1815 map that's been modified in the title. Now it says map of the state of Maine to celebrate statehood. Um, in 1816, we can still see the Penobscot County, uh, Penobscot River line and um, the Indian lands to either side of it, especially north of the Piscataquis River. Um, by 1820, these have been shrunk by an 1818 treaty to um, the northern extent of land has been removed, is no longer uh, part of, uh, allowed to be part of the Penobscot Nation. And we have just these four towns uh, left um, by 1820. And I need to say that by 1833, there's a further treaty that destroys these towns as well and reclaims them for white settlement or timbering as the case may be. In this map, which is the last ver well, penultimate version of Greenleaf's second big map of Maine and New Brunswick from 1829, um, we see no Penobscot lands at all at this scale. At this point, the Penobscot are basically restricted to Old Town uh, Indian Island. One nice thing about this map is it has been extensively annotated. Um, as you can see here, and it does show one tract colored in brown uh, are held by Indians. This is the one township that was reserved by a 1794 treaty together with a very small island at Pleasant Point that was reserved for the Passamaquoddy. Um, Passamaquoddy still have this town because frankly, it's lousy and nobody, no Anglo wanted it. So Passamaquoddy left with it. The annotations on this map are really nice for showing that the, the territorially speaking, uh, Maine statehood was really a divorce. When Maine separated from Massachusetts in 1820, a vast area of the northern, northern country was yet undefined by the Americans. It had been unsold um, and it effectively um, represented a joint asset that had to be divided between the two parties, between Massachusetts and Maine. So in this map, we have uh, showing in red outline, a bit faded because of water damage, I'm afraid, we have lands belonging to Massachusetts and then we have in blue lands belonging to Maine. And then out um, further west, we have all the lands in green that have yet to be subdivided into towns and sold off. We also have uh, quite nicely in this, in this map, uh, an indication of how Massachusetts had also given land to a variety of what they call literary institutions. Um, what are now colleges and academies, uh, historical societies and things. Um, the idea being that the um, academies or uh, colleges would um, rent the land, sell the land, sell the timber of the land to raise money to build buildings and now chairs and what have you. Quite a few of these when you start looking at these maps. Over time, the towns, these six by six mile towns, were further subdivided into lots for rent or for sale, depending on who was claiming the land, who was owning the land. 
Um, this happens to be um, the town of Orono. There is the northern, that distinctive shape of the northern edge of the town of Bangor. And so we're looking at the town of Orono and then the islands out in the Mississippi, oh, Mississippi. where did that come from? <laughs> out in the Penobscot River uh, and in, in the square, we've got Indian Old Town. Um, and we can see quite clearly, um, especially in this detail, the subdivision of the land into various lots for agriculture uh, in this case. This map is to my mind as sketchy and as cruddy and as dirty as it is. This map is to my mind the third most important map in the show. Um, the first was that 1670s manuscript map in New England um, by Massachusetts Bay. And a third I'm gonna to come to uh, in a short while. I'm gonna end the presentation with that third one. Um, this is a town of Orneville, Township One Routes, uh, Range Six, north of Wardo Patent, uh, NWP. Um, surveyed in the 1820s. Um, there's a story about this, which I don't have time to get into. Um, so we have an entire six mile by six mile block, but a surveyor, John Sherman, has run through a series of vertical lines um, and some east-west lines as well. And as he's run these traverses, he has uh, kept track of some of the details. There's a nice little legend on the side. So a number one indicates that the that little section of the traverse features hardwoods of the first quality. Two would be mixed wood of mostly hard, good quality. Three would be again mixed, second degree quality. Four mixed woods, second quality, five mixed. Six um, would be black pine of poor quality and so on. And he also indicated bogs, land, swamps, swamp cedar, pine, meadows, and so on. This kind of work, and here's a detail of it, this kind of work is essential for the owners of the towns to figure out how much land, how much to charge uh, either to rent to a timber company to remove the timber or to sell to somebody who might want to actually settle. Uh, this kind of work is it's it's pervasive, but it's almost hidden because these maps, you can see, it's, it's scrappy, it's dirty, uh, it doesn't, they don't really survive very well. In all of these practices, in all these colonial mapping processes, usurping and acquiring Wabanaki lands, turning Maine into a neat territorial hierarchy of counties and towns assessing the commercial value of the land and dividing it up for sale and rent. The Wabanaki were mapped out, but they did not themselves disappear. In the 19th century, they worked in seasonal trades, lumbering, potato harvesting, blueberry picking, and also in art and craft sales to tourists, ranging from Bar Harbor and Mount Desert uh, all the way across to Poland Spring uh, and up to Mount Kineo on Moosehead Lake. They became more integrated into the main economy in the 20th century, but they remained effectively marginalized, living in the gaps, the interstices within uh, Anglo settlement and Anglo society. Their oral traditions persisted, but because we're so attuned to maps as being graphic objects, um, it's hard to see them, which is why I emphasize in the show the remarkable survival of an oral map. It's a map that is a consolidation of a great deal of information, uh, and it was presented for a white readership, but it's indicative of long-standing practices of both experiential learning and oral transmission of spatial knowledge Within the, within the Wabanaki peoples themselves. It's a map provided by the Penobscot elder, Joseph Nicola, in a column for a weekly newspaper um, 
published about 1887. It appears in the single the Old Town Herald is one of these newspapers that sprung up in the late 19th century and it is impossible to find copies of this of these things now. We know about it because the historian Fanny Hardy Exxon in the 1930s found the oral map, the transcription of this oral map in a cutting of a column that uh, Nicola wrote under the pseudonym of Young Sabatis. Quote, in a scrapbook found in a rubbish tip, abandoned in an old house. So if you know anything about Maine, this is such a quintessentially old Maine thing. You've got old settlement pushed in land, retreated when the fields gave out, the house deteriorated and somewhere there's a rubbish tip and in there's a scrapbook and in that scrapbook is this map. Here's the map. Um, much of it is an explanation of place names in the context of Penobscot life, starting on the west side of Penobscot Bay and working northwards. And it has some interesting details. For example, the west side of the river is the most traveled because the east side, the currents and the, uh, especially in the tidal part of the bay, uh, are very problematic and very difficult to work with. And it records the names and the cultural context and resources at each place along the west side of the bay. For me, though, the crux of this text is not the individual place names, but Nicola's account of the communal message board, as it were, at Fort Point on the western shore of the Penobscot Bay. This passage is indicative of the practices of long distance communication, like those birch bark of a Kekanol, by which bands and groups stayed in contact with the larger community, by which they were become spread apart in the summer, come together in the winter, and so on. It's worth reading it as a whole. Now we come to the celebrated Aqua Hesedek. I can never say this, my apologies. Stepping ashore, now known as Old Fort Point, where hundreds of pleasure seekers during the summer months enjoy the cool sea breeze. But in the olden times, when, when a member of the tribe visited here, they only stopped long enough to make the sign of their visit, showing which direction they were going, the number of their party in canoes, etc. On account of its being a marking place, no one was ever allowed to mar or deface its outline by using it for a camping ground. The reason for selecting this for a marking place was because of it being the last prominent point of entering the river from the bay or going out into the bay from the river. And coming or going from the eastern or western shore, all stopped here and made their marks. All the families of our tribe were known by a mark. Some were represented by animals, fish and reptiles, and others by well-known implements, the moon, sun, etc. Each mark showed the number of the family and the direction taken. It is through this persistence of the Penobscot, um, but also the Passamaquoddy, the Mi'kmaq, Manasit, other groups within the Wabanaki, um, that the Penobscot nation has been, east, has been able to engage in a project to, re, to, to basically recover uh, and restore Penobscot place names and the cultural history that goes with them and the mapping of, of the region that goes with them uh, in a project by the Penobscot nation. This is how we name our lands published in 2015. Um, it's published in two parts. On one side shown here uh, is the Penobscot place names. And on the other side, shown on a facing wall in the exhibit, um, is the English language side. So you can see the, 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 the Penobscot name and the English name. This map to me, um, not quite as important as um, Nicola's oral map, um, nonetheless demonstrates the persistence of the Penobscot in the efforts to reclaim territorial control some degree successfully um, within the, the state of Maine. So we have this, basically then we have this large narrative in the show that runs between um, the initial idea of uh, Massachusetts and Maine in the early period, running all the way up through um, 1842 and the boundary, dis boundary dispute, which is a whole different topic 
And if you want to know, learn more, go please look at the show online, or if you can, get to it in person. Thank you. Matthew, thank you for that interesting talk. And um, I'd say you've really shown us some new and interesting maps, particularly the manuscript ones. Uh, while we may be waiting for some questions in the chat, I will raise one. I'm impressed. As you know, I've, my interest is the uh, General Land Office and the institution of the uh, rectangular surveys uh, in the Midwestern and the Western states. And I think it seems to be a very interesting parallel here, the squareness of the townships and the use of the township and range. Uh, I mean, it's almost I would say it's almost assumed that Maine is following the pattern that the General Land Office developed. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Yes. Um, I shut down the PowerPoint. Let me go back and just re um, show you that that um, first map and. Let me share. Sorry. Um, so there's two things going on. On the one hand, we have um, uh, where are we? A bit further. And yeah. So we take this map, I'm just gonna delete that for two seconds. Um, the Southern lands are, are laid out roughly square. The, the bottommost lands, you actually see this most clearly. Uh, the southernmost lands are laid out uh, all down here, all higgledy piggledy every which way, mostly oriented to water features and stuff. These are all laid out in the colonial period uh, before independence. And then you have a, a middle band. If you can see my, my cursor moving. Um, then this area are all gridded, but at a slight angle. These are lands laid out uh, between the revolution and 1820. They're at an angle because they're all laid out with respect to magnetic north. And as a result, there are some interesting um, problems when you have a line that was surveyed twice in different years and the magnetic variation has shifted the line slightly. Um, and the lands to the north, um, this sort of big gridded section to the north, um, are all the lands laid out after 1820 with respect to true north. So this last batch of lands, um, so-called wells, west of the east line of the state lands, are uh, actually laid out using the same principles as the General Land Office Rectangular Land Survey System. The other lands in before that laid out to true north reflect older practices of the later of the late colonial early, early Republic period that informed the formation of the general land office. So you have different, there's the different phases going on here. Um, at some point, Ron, I'll give you my whole spiel about the, um, about William Douglas's map of plan of New England, which I think is the missing link in all of this, but in terms of creating the idea of a, reg of a regular land survey. Okay. We can talk offline. I think there may be other questions. Can you see them, Matthew, or do you want me to? Uh, if you could read them, please, because I'm I have no idea who's who said what, when, where. Um, um, John Doctor Moses Greenleaf map and later maps show land divided into blocks, but the orientation of the blocks varies across the map. Was there no baseline? Why the variation? I think you were, you've right. spoken to that. So the, yeah. So the 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 north oriented, all sorts of different local surveys, 
Um, so that Ornville is the, pat the area surveyed as north of Waldo Patent. You've got north of Bingham's Kennebec Patent and other areas. Um, the standard meridian for the northern surveys, the regular uh, true north surveys, is the, the eastern line, uh, eastern boundary of the state. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, Tim Weiskel. Uh, okay. Lots of lots of questions. What about the French and the Dutch mapping of the coastal areas? Most of what you presented represents Anglo mapper, mappers, no? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, this, this particular exhibit and then this particular cut through that exhibit is geared around um, Anglo settlement and um, Wabanaki peoples. I don't have any coastal charts in the show, for example. Um, I don't have space. So uh, it's the coastal charts where you get the French work and the Dutch work. Um, so completely unashamedly, um, yeah, important in some respects, but not for this show. Okay, Andrew Reynolds, may I ask the different reasons, uses, purposes for the marking place? Abstractly, I can understand vaguely the reason idea. There were few ways to identify people and keeping a history of sorts. Any other purpose? From what I understand, and this is where I make clear statement, I am not a specialist in any shape, way or form uh, about Native American studies or languages. Um, I have friends who are, <laughs> and they assure me. Um, the idea of the meeting places uh, was not a place to, to come together and actually meet in this, in this particular uh, old four point instance, uh, but really was just to tell people where we are, you know, which way we're going, how many people in our family now. Um, the, especially the Penobscot, I mentioned, um, you know, east of the Kennebec River, um, which is here's the, here's the Kennebec down here, here's the Penobscot, uh, from Kennebec east is largely hunter-gatherers. They had a seasonal migra migration, uh, winter inland, um, often in larger groups, um, hunting in the forests. Uh, in the spring, they move down the rivers to the coast. They spend the summers at the coast fishing um, and then moving back into the interior uh, for the winter. And originally when, when they started doing corn um, cultivation uh, several thousand years ago, uh, further south, um, as they went towards the sea, they would plant the corn and they would harvest it as they moved back away from the sea into the interior. And eventually, though, the, the cornfields got productive enough that they could live year round. There also helps having ceramic pots uh, in which you could store the grain uh, through the year. Um, so you could grow more of it and, and store it and, and have more focused fittages. But in this area around the Penobscot, it stays uh, seasonally migratory right through uh, into 19th century. Um, and in that context, people would, the, the various bands would come together um, as groups into large villages in the summer and the winter, um, and then spread out more during the spring and the fall. Uh, and the, the markings were ways in which to tell everybody else where we are. Um, although you know that you're gonna be joining each other at the standard sites uh, for spring and for, for winter and for summer. Um, settlement. Um, and it's in the larger groups that you have the more established oral transmissions of historical tradition and, um, and knowledge, as well as the um, all the knowledge you get from moving around the space, uh, the territory to begin with. And there's also lots of individuals who are moving around as well, back and forth between individual bands, um, going out on their own, especially young men, um, who are communicating as well between bands. It's a very, very complex, very integrated web of knowledge and, and interaction. Okay. 
Okay, Glenn Page uh, thanks you and asks, how does the analysis of these maps inform the condition of natural ecosystems and any evidence towards stewardship, any governance response to eco ecosystem change? The most of the Anglo maps um, that are detailed enough to show um, information um, really, to my knowledge, have not, from this early period, have not been studied. Um, they're few and they're scattered. Um, if they survive, they may survive in um, private archives of, of timber companies and engineering companies. Um, that one of Vaughanville that, that we have was actually um, probably collected by Moses Greenleaf himself. Um, but generally speaking, the environmental work that's been done, to my knowledge, uh, in terms of trying to reconstruct um, environment, is really based on field work and um, interactions, oral interactions with uh, Native peoples in the landscapes. One of the things that's, that's really become established over the last 20 years um, is that the kinds of stories, the kinds of insights that you get um, that are told, the kinds of stories that are told when indigenous groups are sitting in their winter quarters are quite different from the kind of stories you get when you actually go out into the land. Um, small groups out hunting tell different sets of stories about different kinds of things and because anthropologists traditionally never actually went out with the hunting parties, they never learned all that side of, of territoriality and the, 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 the spatial nature of hunter-gatherer existence. Um, so that's the kind of information that is being used now, to my knowledge, in trying to understand the more finer nuances of environmental change. Um, the, maps like the On Onville map are just not common enough and they don't cover large enough areas to be really useful. Um, and I should just happen to have a very nice case study of Marshall's Pond or Sunday Pond, neither of which are called that nowadays. Anyway. Okay, Patrick uh, McGranahan asks, does Henry David Thoreau feature in any of this time and place in history? Absolutely. So this map, um, when Henry David Thoreau, who of course was a surveyor by training and, and profession, um, first traveled up into the Maine woods in 18... About 1845, I think it was. I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, the first night up north out of Bangor, they stopped at a, at a timber inn, timber inn uh, mm -hmm. place catering to the workers in the in the timber trade in Skowhegan, I think it was. Um, and he recorded that on the wall in the inn was the latest edition of Greenleaf's map of Maine, which is the map on the screen. And um, so he dutifully, not having a map with him, because he was going to be using Wabanaki guides for um, his, his travel, um, he dutifully took the map off the wall, waxed some paper to make it transparent, and traced what he recalls as saying as a labyrinth of errors. Um, Green, uh, Greenleaf's map is not the best on the details because he's deriving it, his data from other sources which have frequently been gone through a couple of generations of work. Uh, and then Thoreau goes on to say mm -hmm. that the only decent map of the interior yeah, yeah, good was that made by uh, George Coffin, who was a land agent from Massachusetts. And um, he had made in 1835, a big map uh, to keep track of the sale of land um, and the stages in the sale of land. Uh, and also in the show 
is a recently conserved copy of the, the manuscript copy of the, of the coffin printed map. Um, don't have time to get into it here, but that copy, if you go to Concord Public Library and you look online, you can find Thoreau's own map collection. And you can find his copy of the coffin map with all his annotations about routes he took and stuff. Okay. Hey, there's still quite a few questions, but why don't we take just one more here? This one's from Anthony McLeod, and apparently he's from Sydney, Australia. Uh, was there any... Was there ever any serious chance that Maine might have become part of Canada? No. And did, it, and did this influence the mapping in, in any and for against, against way? Thanks for a great talk coming through loud and clear to Sydney, Australia. Thank you. Um, no, there was no way, um, mostly because in the, in the period we're talking about, um, Again, looking at this map on the screen, the area to the west of Maine is New Brunswick, which was largely unsettled by any European colonization process um, right up until the revolution. And this became uh, suddenly down here uh, in the St. John area. Um, this became a focal point for the settling of loyalists who, who left the colonies during the revolution and they were all granted land in this part of uh, British territory um, and later was, was organized as the province of New Brunswick and there was no way the Mainers were going to go join these guys even though there's a lot of cousins across and certainly the Wapanaki all, all over this area. And then over here towards the St. Lawrence, you've got Quebec, which is from the point of view of the English in Maine, um, there are a bunch of French Catholics and we don't like them. Um, it's the French timbermen who are coming down and, and trying to, to use the, uh, the timber lands in northern Maine that led to almost war between the US and Britain in 1839, the so-called Aristoc War. Um, this whole area is called Aristotle County. Um, and that in turn led to the 1842 Treaty of Washington, which finally settled the boundary here. Um, now in this period, there was a lot of, um, Maine was white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. Um, of course, there are lots of Francophones and a lot of Irish squatters, and of course, all the Wapanaki. Um, but politically speaking, it was very white. Um, and very self-aware of that fact. Okay. okay, Matt, do you have time for one more, Matthew? Sure. Another one from Tim. Markings of movements were very important, but what about establishing use of fruit rights, i.e. territories for t traditional calling of deer, beaver, waterfowl, et cetera? Were there, there any indications in indigenous maps of these territories of customary exploitation extraction? versus cornfields? Not so much in, um, in the graphic maps um, that survive, which are mostly root and sort of migratory slash how to get from A to B kind of diagrams that those were coconuts. Um, but in place names, in indigenous toponyms, if you treat them properly, you don't over fantasize them and romanticize them which has been a major problem in the past. Um, you've actually ground them in linguistic analyses as the new map of, the new Penobscot map of Maine is. Um, then you can start to see, as Joseph Nicola was suggesting, that there are, the place names are, um, a variety of different kinds of place names. There are place names that are about resources, place names that are about activities, um, place names that are descriptive. Um, the falls, right? One of the reasons that Bangor was created um, was that there's a whole series of falls in the Penobscot River, um, which are, of course, why the Penobscot main settlements were there, because the falls are a major resource site. Um, but the fall, there's one set of the falls, which, are, which in Penobscot are called White Falls, because as you're coming up, upriver going uh, against the flow, uh, canoeing northwards, the falls appear to be white. Um, 
but there are other parts of the falls which bear names about the, the fishing um, that can be done at those locations, for example. So there's a, there's a very wide array of place names and it's the place name evidence that um, seems, if I remember right, to, be, to have been crucial in a, in a very important case. Um, the first stage in the Penobscot reassertion of their rights that have been progressively denied them over the centuries was to say that the limitation, that final limitation to the islands was actually a limitation to the river. Uh, and so that the Penobscot have the right, not just to the land of the islands in the Penobscot river, but to the water of the river itself and the resources, fish, beaver of the water and the right of travel through the water. Um, and that was done through place name analyses uh, to show that um, these are places that traditionally Penobscot have used uh, and should never have been taken away from them in the first place. 